Uh, before I begin today, I want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, first off, over the weekend, several people identified a couple of uh, bugs in uh, the, project, uh, the class libraries and the, uh, and the submission system. These have been fixed. Uh, you will need to re-download uh, JSQL Parser. Uh, a new version will be up later tonight, and I'll post an announcement to Piazza to that effect. Uh, while these bugs have been getting uh, fixed, I also threw in a new feature for the website. Um, if it comes up, uh, you'll note that there is now a metrics tab. Um, if you go to this, uh, there are two features. There is a leaderboard for each, uh, for every uh, query uh, taking part in a given project and you'll also see this little performance trace which will show how your group has been doing uh, on that particular query over time as well. This is just uh, data that we've already been gathering so figured uh, why not give you guys access to it so you have a little bit more information. All right so uh, let's get going with today's lecture. So last class, we took a little bit of a break from the systems implementation side of things to talk about how databases are designed. Uh, and in particular, how to go about uh, designing the schema for a database. We introduced the entity relation model, uh, which was kind of a nice way to uh, think about how a schema should be designed. Uh, it had these basic constructs called entities and relationships between entities, uh, and then sets of entities and sets of relationships. And we also talked about weak entities uh, as a hierarchies and aggregation. Now, uh, entity resolution, uh, entity uh, relationship model doesn't give you one specific way of uh, modeling a particular data set, but it's a great way to kind of think about the various strategies uh, that you can take to model uh, a given workflow, sorry, a given, uh, a given data set. So we talked about this from a high level. Now let's take it down uh, to a slightly deeper level and talk about uh, how we actually represent these, these constructs uh, in a relational database itself. More to the point, uh, we talked about a couple of different types of constraints, uh, a couple of different ways of uh, restricting the data in such a way that uh, we knew certain things about it that we could potentially use uh, exploit uh, when query processing and uh, when just writing queries to make sure that we're on the same page as the people who, uh, who designed the database. So. SQL uh, defines a, a class of constructs called integrity constraints. And integrity constraints serve two purposes. Uh, first off, uh, they tell us what, uh, they give us some notion of correctness for the data. Uh, so a database often has, uh, I mean, a table can have uh, many different uh, values uh, of tuples, but there are some things that just don't make sense. Um, if I have a, four, uh, a, a zero to four um, uh, grading scale, then it doesn't make sense for me to give someone a grade of five. I mean, you know, may, maybe, maybe they uh, actually want that, but uh, in general, there's certain kind of constraints that we want to place on our data. And this can give us two things. Uh, first off, it gives us a way of validating the data. It gives us a way of making sure that no matter what happens, the, the data in the database is, uh, satisfies a set of assumptions that we're working with. And the other advantage is that this gives us the ability to uh, optimize query evaluation over the data uh, by taking advantage of some of these constraints. Okay, now we're going to talk today about four different kinds of uh, constraints. The first, domain constraints, apply to individual values. So these tell us uh, properties that individual values can satisfy that are stronger uh, than just the basic type information. Uh, case in point, the uh, grades on a zero to four scale. A grade of five is invalid. Uh, so we could place a domain constraint on that value that says uh, grades can only be uh, greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to four. Uh, 
Another type of constraint we're going to talk about is key constraints. So a key constraint is a way of asserting, uh, identifying, inform or talking about identifying information for a given, uh, for rows in a, in a table. Uh, so a key constraint is essentially one or more fields uh, such that all of the values of that, uh, those key fields have to be unique. Uh, the other attributes can overlap as, as much as you want, but you have to have at least, uh, y you can't um, have duplicate values of those keys. A good example of this would be your UBIT. So no two people can have the same UBIT, uh, which makes the UBIT a great way to refer to individual people or individual rows in the, the database. A foreign key constraint is a way of referring to a key constraint. You can think of this kind of like a pointer in, uh, in C, except SQL, uh, because we're pointing to something that we can delete or manipulate, a uh, foreign key constraint in SQL also gives us the ability to uh, kind of assure uh, the liveness of that pointer. I'll get into what I mean by that in a little bit. And finally, uh, table constraints are kind of this catch-all uh, that refers to anything. Um, you can basically define anything that you can programmatically define uh, as a true-false condition, uh, you, can, uh, you can encode as a table constraint. So this is basically like everything else. Okay. Any questions up to this point? Any questions on anything? All right. <clears throat> Um, I will have those at the, uh, so I'm just giving you kind of a high level view of what we're, what we're going to be talking about and I'll get into the details now. Okay, so a domain constraint is, uh, you can think, the simplest type of domain constraint you can think of is essentially the type of a given field. So a, a, a string is a specific type or a float is a specific type. And a domain constraint can be used to place an even stronger restriction on this. Now, this is technically part of SQL. Uh, different database implementations have their own uh, way of uh, defining these kinds of things, so I'm not going to go too much into the SQL syntax, uh, but the basic idea is that you have a high-level um, expression of what's allowed in a given uh, value. And this is uh, typically done by means of a check clause. So you define a Boolean expression over the possible values uh, that a given attribute can take, and then that uh, check clause uh, either well, returns true if it, uh, the value is legitimate or returns false if it's not. And you'll see two different variations of this. Uh, one is uh, that you actually create an entirely new type. Uh, so for example, in, uh, in Postgres, you create a new rank uh, type that uh, has to be between zero and five. Um, Oracle, on the other hand, assigns these uh, to tables. So you, you'll have a check constraint on individual values uh, that appear in a table. Okay. Uh, the purpose of this is mostly for data entry errors. There are some cases where an optimizer can benefit from it, but the, those are usually uh, few and far between. This is basically just sanity checking your data. Now there's one specific type of domain constraint uh, that arises in a number of different uh, situations uh, called not null. And this, so typically any value in a database can take a null value, uh, can be null. Uh, not null basically says, I really, 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 really want that data to be there. And anytime you try and insert some data that uh, is missing values, well, that, that's not legitimate. So anytime you try and update a table uh, without inserting, uh, in this case, an uh, officer ID, well, that's, uh, that's not going to work. In this case, that makes a lot of sense because we want a unique identifier for each officer. We want to have some way of specifically referring to that particular officer. And if it's not there, well, that table is now kind of worthless. Or, well, not the entire table is worthless, but uh, it makes the data in that table uh, suspect. <clears throat> 
Any questions on domain constraints? OK. Key constraints. So a key constraint is a way of uniquely identifying uh, specific uh, uh, tuples in a relation or specific entities in an entity set. And there can be uh, any kind of uniquely identifying information is uh, sufficient. So in this case, if I don't have an officer ID, uh, perhaps I can use the birthday and the name uh, for, uh, to identify a given officer. Although interestingly enough, uh, age, the age of an officer, is directly connected to the birthday. So, I mean, if I change the birthday, I change the age. Uh, so, in this particular example, I can actually have two different keys. Uh, both birthday and name, as well as birthday and age, are ways of uniquely identifying entities in this set. So, to be clear, a key is basically just a way of uh, uniquely identifying a tuple. So the, the restriction here is that no two tuples can have the same values for a given key attribute. And if that property is satisfied, then those uh, attributes form a key. More importantly, though, is there's this idea of a uh, minimal key, or well, a key is, is, has to be minimal. So it can't be the case that multiple attributes, well, use the example here, um, name and age and birthday isn't a key because I can take away either age or birthday and uh, still have that property satisfied. It's still the case that name and age is a key and it's still the case that name and birthday is a key. We refer, refer to any kind of uh, set of attributes that includes a key and then a couple of other attributes as a super key. So that's a, a super key is essentially a key plus a couple of extra a set of key attributes plus a couple of extra attributes. Um, any questions? Mm-hmm. Sorry? Where is the super key used? Uh, the question is, where is a super key used? Um, so a super key typically isn't used while modeling a database. What you can do is, so a super key typically arises when you're trying to find a key. So it's just a way of uh, saying that this, uh, this is a step towards a key, but it's not quite there yet. Um, so if I have a super key, if I have, if I start with the attributes name, age, birthday, and you know I start thinking about okay, which one do I take? Can I take any of these attributes away, um, and still have a key? Uh, if the answer is yes, then I have a super key. Basically, it's just a way of referring to something that isn't quite a key yet. You'll and then you kind of take steps to get there. Okay, uh, right. So translating this to SQL, uh, there are two ways of uh, telling a SQL, uh, telling a relational database that uh, a given set of attributes is a key. And the first of these is to simply refer to something as a primary key. So in this example, uh, officers has this OID attribute, this officer ID attribute, uh, that I label as the primary key. And that basically says, OK, OID is unique for every tuple. And the other way uh, is to define a constraint uh, using the unique keyword. And in this case, uh, name and birthday have to be unique. I could also use um, an unnamed constraint. Or name and age are also unique. Um, the second example there, constraint officer day, unique name birthday, gives me a way of talking about that constraint. So if I want to uh, modify the, uh, that 
constraint, I can refer to it as officer day. Um, I want to alter, uh, alter anything later on. I need to be able to point to that specific constraint and say that I, I want to modify that one. Now, what's the difference between these two? Oh, right. Now, what's the difference between these two? So, unique identify. Oops. Ah. So, unique identifies a specific uh, type of key constraint. No, sorry. Unique simply identifies a key constraint. Um, it tells post or tells the the database. Uh, this is something you should be checking for. Um, if I ever try and insert a duplicate value of either name and age or name and birthday, then uh, throw that data away or tell, tell me or throw an error, do something about it. Uh, but unique is essentially just a constraint. It doesn't do anything else. Primary key, on the other hand, is special. It's a special way of identifying a key constraint uh, that actually tells the database, this is a good thing for you to organize the data on. Uh, it basically says, this is specifically how I'm going to be referring to tuples in that table. So in this case, name and age, while I may want to keep them unique, aren't necessarily a great way of talking about individual officers, whereas uh, an officer ID might be a great way to kind of refer to individual officers. Similarly, if I had uh, your name and age, that would probably be a thing that is unique, but a UBIT is a much more efficient way of referring uh, to any data that, disc that talks about you. Uh, and right, the one other thing here is this constraint clause, which basically gives me a way of uh, naming a given constraint so that I can talk about it later. Um, also beneficial, uh, anytime there's an error message, that error message is going to include that name. So if you name it, it makes debugging a bit easier. Okay. Any questions about key constraints so far? Yeah. So the question is, wouldn't this kind of constraint uh, affect performance um, of insertions? That's actually that's a really good question. Why would you say that it might? So any uh, so if you define a constraint, uh, then you're in. You're giving the database a bit more overhead every time you do an insertion, because now it needs to check to see if any of those constraints are violated. And you're completely correct. Um, these are sanity checks. Uh, if they're the primary key is a little bit of an exception because you're going to be organizing the data by the primary key anyway. So if there's a duplicate value, you can usually figure it out. But the all of the constraints that we're talking about here are mostly conveniences uh, for, uh, for anyone who's uh, using, or using the data in this uh, relation. It basically says, uh, okay, I can assume that there's no two people with the same birthday. So when I write a query over this data, uh, then the, I, I can make that assumption without worrying about it too much. Um, and yes, the database is, this is going to slow the database down because every time you need to insert a value, well, you need to make sure that that value is satisfied. Um, this is why you generally don't see, uh, see constraints used uh, frequently in production database systems. Um, they're they're more, much more common in ad hoc query style uh, databases where you're, you're basically an analyst is sitting there writing queries manually. Uh, they make the data much saner, but they slow things down a lot. So, yeah. does that address your question? Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, do you uh, is a constraint on name and age necessary given that you already have a constraint on name and birthday? Uh, 
Yes and no. Uh, depends on what you, the designer, are trying to make sure that the analyst querying this data can be sure of. Uh, is it, does it make sense for me to write two test cases that exercise the same, uh, the same part of my code in two different ways? Sometimes it does. Um, this is, you can think of this as very similar to a test case uh, in, uh, when writing code, because that's essentially what this is. It's, it's debugging your data. Um, so are, are two of them necessary? Again, depends on how rigorous you want to be about your testing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so primary key also uh, inserts a not null do domain constraint in many databases. Yeah. Uh, could you repeat that, please? Like unique name page over mm -hmm. here, it does not have any constrained names. Oh, so there's, uh, in this example, uh, the first unique constraint is unnamed, and so how would you modify it later on? Uh, the short version is that this depends on the database. The slightly longer version is that the database will usually pick an arbitrary name to refer to that constraint as. Um, it won't be nearly as uh, readable or understandable as officer day or whatever you want to put in there, uh, but there will almost always be some name that gets generated. All right, so where are we? Ah, okay. So key constraints are a way to refer to uh, individual, uh, sorry, are a way to define uniqueness uh, for specific attributes. And primary keys are a way to refer to individual rows in a table. Foreign key constraints uh, make use of this. So yesterday we talked about these relationships between different tables. Um, all of those lines are essentially, uh, essentially correspond to uh, foreign key constraints. They're essentially, you can think of the, them kind of like pointers uh, in, uh, in an object-oriented language. These get defined in uh, SQL using the foreign key uh, construct. So in this case, uh, the visited relation defines a pointer to both the officer's relation and the planet's relation. Uh, so it says that uh, for my foreign key OID references officers. So the, the OID attribute of the visited table uh, is being treated as a pointer into the officers table. One interesting note here is that unlike pointers in a, uh, in a programming language, you can kind of go backwards. So you can find all of the, uh, you can use this kind of pointer to find all of, the, um, all of the visited entities for a given officer as well. There are some cases where the attribute names are going to be different from the attribute. Uh, the attribute names in the source relation are going to be different from the attribute names in the target relation. So in this case, uh, primary key subordinate. Um, in this case, I want to define a uh, subordinate commander relation. So I need. Uh, if I need to tell SQL that the subordinate attribute refers to the OID attribute in the officer's relation, I can just put that in parentheses after the, the relation name. So this basically says subordinate references uh, officer OID, uh, commander also references officer's OID. Any question up to this? Any questions up to this point? Yeah. Uh, the OID being underlined, uh, so OID being underlined means that OID is a key for the officer's relation. Okay, 
So another way to encode this would be to have a single, uh, so, excuse me. Now using a relation to encode relationships is pretty general. But there are some cases where you can actually avoid this. Um, and those cases occur when you have uh, either a one-to-many or a, uh, a one-to-many, a many-to-one or a one-to-one -one relationship between, um, between uh, entities. Now, if you have one of those, then you can actually, because there's, uh, it's one-to-many, um, on the one side, you can put a pointer back to whatever entity you're trying to link to. So I could represent the commands uh, relation, uh, sorry, relationship within the officer's relation by adding a commander attribute. So in this case, the uh, relationship is one to many. Every officer has exactly one commander. So I can create uh, a, an attribute in the officer's table that basically points back to itself. So the commander of an officer is back to, uh, points back to uh, the, the officer that commands them. Quick question, make sure you guys are still awake. How do we represent, uh, in, this, uh, in this example, uh, the top of the hierarchy, the, the, one, the fleet admiral who has no commanding, no commanding officer? Yeah? No. So if there's no, nothing to point to, well, you point to null. OK. All right. Yeah, and same thing for inserting the first tuple into officers. Well, you start from the top, or you, um, you can update things. Yeah? Uh, yeah, so commander, if uh, commander you can think of as a pointer in this example. Um, and if you're at the top of the hierarchy and there's nothing to point to, well, you point to null. Foreign key allows null. Foreign key allows null point. Uh, that is a great question, and I'm going to answer that, and that actually leads into my next, uh, my next point. So, um, actually, not... I'm not going to answer it in the next slide, but in about two or three, we'll, we'll get to, uh, to how that works. All right, so um, we have all of these constraints, and we have a couple of different, uh, we want to be able to make sure that the data satisfies these constraints. So how do we go about that? And there's a couple of different ways to uh, there's a couple of different ways of going about this. Uh, the simplest is to simply reject any kind of modification to the data that would violate a constraint. Uh, so if I try and do an insertion or a deletion or an update or any combination of these, uh, we'll talk about transactions later in the term, but any combination of these that results in a constraint being violated, we simply throw it away. We throw an error message. Sorry, your, your update would violate the data, the constraints that we're trying to maintain on the data. Too bad. Um, and so when we try and, well, uh, if we're doing insertions, we need to check domain and key constraints. Uh, same thing for updates. Uh, deletions, why is it the case that we don't need to check for domain and key constraints for deletions? Hmm? Right, so we're removing data in those cases. So we just need to make sure that the foreign key constraints are preserved. Now, this is where we get into to your question of, uh, of what happens when these pointers start breaking. What happens we, when because we can manipulate each of these relations independently, what happens when we try and remove something that is pointed to, or what happens when we try and point to something that doesn't exist? So, in addition to this kind of basic enforcement strategy, where we simply throw out any data that doesn't satisfy our constraints, um, 
with foreign key constraints, we can actually do something a little more intelligent. Uh, we can react in some uh, basic ways. So, uh, for example, how should we uh, react to a tuple that uh, points to some sort of uh, to a key that doesn't exist? Or what, what could we do that's a little more intelligent than just throwing everything away? Yeah, so if we can, uh, if we're trying to point to something that doesn't exist, maybe we want to insert. Uh, actually, that's a little bit of a bad example because data, many databases won't do that. Uh, but what about if we're trying to point to a tuple and that tuple suddenly goes away? Yeah, okay, so we could do a couple of things. Uh, one of which is we simply replace that pointer with a null value. And there's a couple of other things. Uh, what if... Um, what if we had a uh, data set that referred to... Uh, excuse me. The a monitoring data set that referred to all of the active transactions, uh, all of the, uh, so Walmart has a table of all of the, um, all of the, all of their stores and the inventory located at all of their stores. So this, uh, there's a foreign key relationship there. Uh, there's a pointer from product, the, the inventory table to the store table. Now, what happens if they sell one of their stores? That store row gets deleted. Um, what would they potentially want to do at that point? Yeah, sell their inventory or just get rid of those. So uh, we could potentially replace uh, all of that. In, uh, the inventory no longer has a store, so we replace it with null. Uh, the other strategy would be to simply delete all of that inventory because it's no longer relevant. So there's a couple of different strategies that you can take for maintaining um, foreign key or re uh, what's called referential integrity uh, in foreign keys. And the first strategy is, well, the basic enforcement strategy. Anytime you try and delete a foreign, uh, delete uh, a data value uh, such that a foreign key dependency would be violated or such that a foreign key would be pointing at something that doesn't exist, you simply throw it out. You throw an error. Um, Yeah. Right. So there's a couple of other strategies. Uh, one other strategy would be to simply delete all of the tuples that point to it. So if I try and delete a planet, um, well, that planet no longer exists, so I no longer uh, have any need for the visited, uh, the visited tuples that point to it. Um, I could disallow the deletion until there's no more um, tuples that reference it. So I have to delete all of the referencing tuples first. Or I could replace all of the referencing tuples references with null. OK, so this is what happens when I delete. What happens when I, what else can I do when I simply update the relation? So for whatever reason, I'm doing some reorganization and my identifier for each planet or my, my name for a given planet uh, changes. What could I do? Uh, what do you mean by domain key constraints? Like, besides uh, like checking the foreign key constraints, you need to also worry about the domain key constraint by updating the top. Okay, so I'll, ne I'll um, assuming that the new name satisfies all of my domain constraints and all of my key constraints. Uh, some planet just underwent a revolution, decided to change its uh, name to the glorious uh, Union of Socialist Peoples, what have you. Um, we have to update the name. What do we want to do uh, with all of the referencing tuples? Yeah? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so in addition to the, uh, the strategies that we had before, 
uh, we could also simply update uh, the, the pointer. And, well, we could do the same things that we did before as well. OK, so how does this manifest in SQL? Whenever you have a foreign key constraint, you can add some on clauses. So on delete or on update, you take some sort of action in response. And SQL defines four different actions, uh, cascade, no action, set default, or set null. Cascade basically says whatever you did to the parent, uh, to, uh, to the, excuse me, uh, to the target, do the same thing to the reference. So if you deleted the target, delete the reference. If you modified the target, modify the reference. Basically, change everything so that all of the pointers work out properly. Um, no action basically says reject. That throw the, don't do anything at all. If, if, the, uh, if someone tries to insert this, um, insert a, uh, a tuple, or sorry, excuse me, someone tries to delete this tuple, then don't do anything at all. Uh, and the final thing is uh, either set default or set null, which basically replace uh, all of the pointers with some default pointer, N null or an explicit value. Okay, any questions up to this point? Yeah. Uh, could you uh, the f I missed the first part of that. Uh, so the question is, uh, if you update the target without updating the sources, then that leads to an inconsistency. So how, um, that's entirely correct. So there, so one of, so either you replace the tuple with, uh, with some default values, in which case you're still consistent because now it's either null or pointing to some default value. You cascade the update, in which case the database, in addition to updating the, the reference tuple, will also update all of the, uh, the referencing tuples. Or uh, no action is a little bit weird. It's no, uh, don't do anything at all. In other words, uh, just reject the update outright. Yeah. Yeah, so if there is any referencing tuple, uh, if there is any tuple referencing the thing you're trying to delete, then it'll cause an error. Yeah. Uh, that's a great example, uh, that's a great question. So what hap how do you go about picking a default value? And typically that's gonna be very uh, dependent on the data that you're working with. Um, simple example, uh, the, you have a bunch of students, uh, the students each have uh, advisors, the advisor uh, retires, the student will typically get defaulted over to a graduate uh, director of graduate studies or director of undergraduate studies. Um, in that example, there is a clear default. Um, most of the time the default is going to be null, but again, there are some cases where, there is, it, where it makes sense to have an explicit default, so it, that capability is, is there. Does that address your question? Any other questions? All right. So we'll talk about transactions a bit later in the term. Uh, for now, you can think of a transaction as essentially a, bulk, uh, a batch or a, a, a set of database update operations or database query and update operations. Constraints have to be able to interact with transactions. Um, and you can do this in one of two ways. So you can either set the constraints 
to react immediately when the operation is performed or when the whole batch of transactions is performed. Again, we'll, we'll get into the details of transactions later on. I just want to bring this up since we're talking about constraints. Um, constraint checking can either be done immediately after you insert, update, or delete uh, the table, or at the very end of the transaction when you're, you're about to, to check. Now, why, why would it make sense to allow a bunch of, of operations to occur before checking the, uh, whether the, uh, the constraints are satisfied? Okay, so there, uh, there might be overlapping operations that interact with the constraints and an intermediate state might be incorrect even though the final state might be correct. So maybe I, wanna ins uh, maybe I want to uh, delete, a, uh, uh, delete a tuple from the relation uh, and then manually kind of re reassign all of the pointers that the foreign key, uh, all of the foreign key pointers that were originally referencing that tuple. Well, if I want to do that as one big atomic operation, at any given point in time, while I'm performing that operation, the data is inconsistent. But when I reach the end and I've actually reassigned all of the pointers correctly, then um, the data is once again consistent. So. I can, tell, I can set a constraint to be checked immediately, uh, which enforces it just right away, or I can set a constraint to be uh, enforced when the transaction has completed, or when the bulk, uh, the batch of operations is complete. So I can kind of have this working state in between. Okay. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll talk a bit, quite a bit more about transactions once, once we start talking about uh, updates, uh, database updates later on in the term. Yep. And uh, deferred constraints uh, can also be used to prevent the performance overhead. Ah, that's a good point. Uh, so the, uh, the, other, uh, the observation is that deferred constraint checking also improves performance. Uh, because, well, if you have a whole bunch of updates you need to perform, you perform them all at once, and then it's often cheaper to check certain kinds of, uh, to check certain kinds of constraints, uh, in particular uniqueness constraints, at the very end of the whole operation. If I load five million records, I don't want to check every single record to see if it's unique. I want to load them all, then just build a sorted list or something, and then I can scan through that sorted list uh, and figure out whether I have duplicate values much more efficiently. Uh, there is a downside, though, in terms of performance. Um, so what happens, what happens if a constraint is violated? Right, so uh, if I, the, the basic enforcement mechanism, the, the default enforcement mechanism, is to simply throw out all of the operations that you've performed. So if I load uh, two petabytes of data and it turns out, whoops, two rows were identical, well, you're, you're, the, the several hour operation of loading all of that data just goes away. So there's kind of a, there's, there's trade-offs. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about today uh, is table constraints. And, well, there's not much here because table constraints are kind of a catch-all term. But a table constraint is essentially any kind of predicate. Um, I can basically put any kind of Boolean expression into a table definition and the system is just going to check to see if that table, uh, if that Boolean expression is true any time uh, that I would normally check uh, a constraint. So in this example, um, what am I trying to do? Uh, sorry? Sorry? 
Yep, so it's scanning every time I update the officer relation, uh, I make sure that none of the officers are on the enterprise. Now, this is kind of redundant. I'd probably want to do something a little more uh, intelligent for this. But my, my point here is that you can put any kind of expression, whatever you want, any kind of Boolean expression in there. And then every time officers is updated, then, uh, then I need to run this query to make sure that, it's, uh, that it returns true. Like I said, this is kind of an example of, of a stupid way to use the check constraint, but any other any questions so far? OK. Now, a check constraint is associated with one specific table. Every time I update the officer table, I need to run that query. But what happens if I have a query that uh, affects multiple tables? The, uh, so one simple strategy would be to just pick one of those tables to associate the check constraint with. So in this case, I have two tables, space stations and planets. And I want to make sure that the number of planets plus the number of space stations is at least 100. Why is it possible that this check constraint might not necessarily work or might not do exactly what I think it does? Uh, well, okay, let, let's say that all of the, I can always add constraints later uh, to a schema. So let's say that this is actually correct. There are, we start off with 100 planets and 100 space stations. So initially this is correct. Or better yet, uh, 50 planets and 50 space stations. So when does this check constraint get run? Uh, when I do an insertion or any kind of update to, to, to the space stations table. So this constraint is specifically associated with the space stations table. So if I delete one space station, I go down to 99 space stations plus planets. Well, it'll figure that out. But what happens if I delete from planets? Nothing. So the way to get around that is to define what's called an assertion. And this is basically the, oh, perfect timing. Um, so SQL defines something called an assertion, which is basically just database wide. And this basically, an assertion is a Boolean predicate that applies to the entire database. So anytime um, I insert, the database should be able to figure out that uh, I have a planets relation, I have a space stations relation. Anytime I modify one of those two, the result of that query is going to change, so I should be able to, uh, or I need to run this check constraint every time I update either of those relations. Or hypothetically, any time I update any relation, really. Okay, so that's kind of our uh, divergence off into uh, data modeling and constraints. Um, are there any questions on anything we've talked about for data modeling, constraints? Project one? Yeah. Um, so check. Uh, ah, yes, you're right. So that um, flip everything I've said. You want at most 100 space stations plus planets. Uh, good catch. That's the, that's the uh, check to see if you're awake uh, feature of today's presentation. All right.
So I'll see everyone uh, next, next lecture.